Welcome to episode 167 of the Ski Podcast and thanks for joining us listener. Today we're going to be discussing what it's like touring the Alps in a camper van, going off grid in the three valleys and we're going to be following up on the Ice Swimming World Championships in Samoen. Now my name's Ian Martin, I'd like to introduce my guest today. We have two first timers on the show. Uh, Katie Bamba is with us today, she is online editor at Full Line magazine and a freelance journalist. Hi Katie, how are you? Hi, very well thanks. Whereabouts are you today? Um, I'm in London today, getting ready for heading out to the Alps soon, my first times of the season. So, Okay, I wasn't sure if you're going to be in London, because I saw a, like a post, I think it was on Facebook, where it looked like you were in Africa. Oh yeah, I have just come back from there, but I'm also just a bit out of date, I'm on catch up mode. <laughs> right, okay, well you're about to go to the Alps as well, we'll talk about that in a minute. We've also got today with us uh, Katia Gaskill, who's a freelance journalist. Hi Katia, how are you? Hi Ian, I'm well, thank you. And whereabouts are you today? Yeah, I'm in London as well, actually, in between journeys to the Alps. So I head back to the snow tomorrow. Excellent. Well, you're making me very jealous. We'll come on to the snow conditions a bit later on. But one of the questions I like to ask uh, all of my guests is, when did you last uh, ski or snowboard? Now, Katya, I, I think I probably have an inside uh, track on that one because I saw you last week in uh, Meribel. But tell us when you last on the snow. Yeah, so I was really lucky. I was there last week. Um, I had a week uh, out in the Alps. So I had three days in Maribel. So my first time skiing back in the Trois Vallées for a long time and really lucky to have really great snow, actually, particularly given the poor start to the season. And then I had three days in Samoa. So got to do a bit of skiing in the Grand Massif as well. So, yeah, I've been, been very lucky. That sounds like a that sounds like a very good uh, trip, and we're going to come back to Samoen a little bit later on. Katie, what about yourself? When you were last on snow, I was. It was last season. It feels like a very long time ago, and it was a very warm April in the Aosta Valley in Chavinia. So it was uh, spring down in the resort with marmots out, and then of course you've got the glacier up top. So right, we're, sorry, were you skiing time. in uh, Chavinia then? I was staying in Chavinia and then because it was so warm, you get up nice and high and then it's a different world up there, isn't it? So kind of straddling Zermatt and Chavinia. Uh, uh, right. OK. And was that in your uh, camper van? We're going to come on to this conversation. <laughs> but was that part of the trip? It was, yes. That was the, the last leg of a full on winter in the van. So, Katie, you haven't skied since, since last season. I think you said to me that you're going out next week. You must be super excited about that. <laughs> Where are you going? Well, I feel like I've packed it all into one. I'm going to La Clusa for the um, SIGB ski tests and then on to Becerra for the free ride world tour and then out to the very snowy states. So I'm looking forward to it all. You say very snowy states, but actually, you know, I've been sharing some photos on social media this morning and it's very snowy in Europe uh, as well, which is uh, which is great. I'm hoping we might get a report from La Clusa into the show a little bit later on. But you mentioned the SIGB uh, ski test. You know, Al Morgan, our equipment uh, guru, comes on the show from time to time. is going to be out there. And he is going to be uh, reporting for us uh, on the show, I think, in a couple of episodes uh, time, uh, just after that's uh, over. But we do have a couple of snow reports to drop in. I'll just drop in my one uh, first. I was in Maribel, Katia said. We saw each other out there last week incredibly lucky really i think we all know that uh, christmas and new year weren't particularly good times for skiing even though up high there was plenty of snow despite what was being reported in some of the media and it snowed a lot before we uh, arrived which was just uh, just great and it meant that you know for me in maribel i actually you know i had some really really good skiing um, I'll mention, you know, I got my skis from InSport like I normally do, and I didn't really know what they were. I asked Al via uh, email, and he tells me they were Sky 7 skis, which are uh, an off-piste uh, ski, like a narrower sibling uh, to the uh, Soul 7, and they'd obviously just put some touring bindings on them, and they were brilliant on the off piece. And I found that, you know, three, four days after that fresh snow, there were still some really nice pitches of uh, off piece, maybe not as deep as it is now. But if you looked around, you know, in the Mirabel Valley and over in Courcheval as well, some brilliant skiing down from Suisse and uh, to the edge of uh, Cura, if people know that. But let's have a listen to some more current uh, snow reports. I've got one from Steve Angus, regular contributor to the podcast, who's out in uh, Val d'Isere. And I'm really pleased to say Stephen Spears has been skiing up in Glencoe in Scotland. So we'll have a listen to what he says as well. Well, I'm standing here at the foot of the uh, slopes here in Val d'Isere. Look out at the Fasta Belvoir and a big, big dump of snow that's been coming out of the sky all day long. 
and uh, on the sledge side and all around me in actual fact lots of snow the Espas Kili Valdez Arantin certainly uh, has been uh, blessed with lots and lots of fresh snow in the last uh, week or so. Uh, last week we had about half a metre, three quarters of a metre of snow. And this week, um, so far, we've already had about another 30 centimetres. And uh, it's expected to be a large, large week of uh, continual top-ups of snow interspersed with a little bit of sun. So the conditions have gone from a little sparse, um, even though we are a high resort to uh, really, really good conditions, albeit with a little bit of wind. Um, so the off-piece conditions are uh, varying. In some places, the snow is very deep and light. In other places, it's quite uh, slabby and heavy. Uh, certainly at higher altitudes, it's better than being lower down, that is for sure. Um, the uh, the piece openings are all looking very good now. Uh, again, we had uh, a limited or relatively limited uh, lower slope openings uh, back down to the valley floor, um, but now things have really got uh, going nicely. Um, the, uh, the weather forecast, generally is for this snow interspersed with a bit of wind and a bit of sun for the next week but certainly as we move into the sort of central part of january snow more snow and uh, really really promising conditions uh, as we move sort of into the middle part of the season so get out there get your transceiver shovel and probe because it is uh, looking like it's going to be uh, a pretty snowy uh, couple of weeks coming up hello this is stephen spears with a snow report for Glencoe Mountain Resort in Scotland and it's Monday 16th of January 2023. This is my 11th day of the season, the fifth one I've had at Glencoe, uh, which is, to be honest, is a bit of a record for me. Uh, usually in Scotland, the season, especially at Glencoe, because of the gullies that need filled in, the season typically doesn't start till mid or later in January, but this year we've cracked it. Uh, and uh, we've got wide snow cover across the mountain now. The big news from Glencoe this year, in addition to the new cafe at the base that opened last year, this year the new Rannoch to Glencoe, that is chair, the Rannoch chairlift has opened and is running, uh, and it's a three-person chairlift, and it's taken away the bottleneck at the bottom of the, the plateau, and it's opened up a whole lot of nice, easier terrain for beginners and early intermediates with big, wide-open runs and uh, nice, gentle gradients uh, for, for folks earlier in their skiing life, as it were. Uh, up higher up the mountain, uh, the wall, the spring run, uh, main basin and Happy Valley all have wide cover. The wall and the spring run have been my pick of the runs today and yesterday. Uh, although everywhere in the mountain at the moment is skiing particularly well. So that's my update from Glencoe Mountain. It's been great to get early uh, skiing in up in Scotland. Hopefully that will continue with not too many thaws, which is always a bit of a risk here. Thanks. And received just in time for this episode, I'm delighted to include this report from Jim Duncan, who long-term listeners will recognise his voice as a co-founder of the Ski Podcast. He is out in La Clusa and reports ahead of the SIGB ski test next week. Hello, podcasters. Jim Duncan here. Nothing to plug. Just epic skiing. Um, I'm waiting for the sun to come out to record this podcast. I know you can't see it, but I can feel the sunshine on my face. I want to try and lift. It's minus 10. Um, got a very cold right hand, which I'm holding my recording device in. But what I can see is probably knee-deep powder pretty much everywhere. The trees are fully loaded. Uh, the mountain tops are wisping snow off the tops. There's people People getting big fat turns. There's even people uh, on piste enjoying what is probably the best conditions of the season so far. I'm skiing around about 100, 1,800 metres um, to 2,000, whatever it is, and uh, the snow is pretty good. It goes all the way down to at least 700 metres, so if you're skiing somewhere low, don't worry, there's plenty of snow at the moment. I've got to go because I think my little finger's about to drop off. Bye! So the situation is very positive. It's been snowing a lot uh, in the Alps, and I believe there's more snow uh, to come as well. Also, personally, I'm very encouraged because I my next trip is out to Italy. Slightly different sort of a uh, trip. I'm going to the Apennines in southern Italy uh, to a resort called Roccaroso. And up until last week, they had no snow at all. However, they've had 50 centimetres in the last few days and there's some more to come. So hopefully that will still happen. I'll be reporting on that. Uh, but Katya, you said after Mirabel, you went over to Samoen. In the last episode, number 166, I interviewed Cathy Munro, who is taking part in the Ice Swimming World Championships. And I am delighted to report that she won uh, a couple of golds and a bronze, uh, I think. 
but Katia, you were out there and you actually watched the the racing. What what was that like? So we arrived in time for the last day. Actually, we arrived in time for the medal ceremony on the the sort of last night, as it was before the the final day of racing. So we saw some of the medal ceremony. We got to join some of the swimmers for dinner. Big plates of tarty flat and uh, chili. You know, it's a really it's a good sport for eating well before you swim. <laughs> And it was just wonderful. I can't tell you how much I love this event. It was, um, it took place in the Lac aux Dames, just on the outskirts of town. And they built a 10 lane swimming pool out of sort of plastic blocks and pontoons um, off the uh, edge of the lake. And there were swimmers of all ages, all sexes, all shapes and sizes. It's possibly the most inclusive competition I've ever seen you know the youngest swimmer was 13 and the oldest was 78. Oh my gosh okay yeah that's an amazing range and and so uh, uh, Kathy told us before the water has to be less than five degrees uh, Celsius and I think it was floating around four or something like that is that right? That's right so it was four degrees and so the way it works they have a uh, sort of a waiting area and then the swimmers arrive with their swim caps on, their goggles, their dry robes, and uh, they stand behind their blocks and the the official sort of tells them to take off their clothes, <laughs> get in the water, and very soon after they're in the water, there's no diving, everybody starts sort of in the water. Um, they hold on with one arm and the the buzzer goes off and, and they swim. And it's really impressive. I mean, it was it was impressive enough watching it and seeing, you know, there was nobody gasping for air. Everybody just sort of went for it. And then to then later go in the water myself and realise just how freezing it actually <laughs> was. It was so cold. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to come on to that because I uh, saw a photo and you went in there uh, yourself. And I am full of admiration uh, for you for that. Uh, you know, I mentioned before I get in the sea here in Brighton uh, from time to time. But I've kind of, I've got out of the habit um, because uh, for various reasons, the sea's been bad and I've been away on a couple of trips and I haven't done it for a month now. Now I'm a little bit trepidatious about it, but you got into this water. It was four degrees, was it? Four degrees. And we had um, some swimmers from the San Juan Swim Club come and join us. I think act as sort of a safety crew, um, including Rob, who is a Brit who lives full time in San Juan and his wife, Carrie. And it was actually Carrie who started swimming year round first and Rob apparently was quite reluctant until lockdown which pushed him like many of us you know to find any water that was available to go swimming and so he started swimming year round as well and then both Rob and Carrie competed in the um in the championships and they both medaled and so they accompanied us with some of their swim crew and you know it was I mean it's cold but if you do it right if you work on your breathing and you go slowly it was amazing it was really amazing I loved and, it and it well that's great to hear and to put it in context so you're not uh, uh, like a, a novice swimmer you do quite a lot of swimming and you do do you know outdoor cold water swimming anyway right yeah it's true so I am um, I have swum since I was young I got into open water swimming probably about five or six years ago and then during uh lockdown is yeah, when I started doing sort of colder water swimming. Uh, but I haven't done it very much this winter because, you know, Lido's have been open again. So uh, this was definitely a bit of a shock. For me, trying to get me back in the water, then what would your tips be for immersing yourself into that very cold uh, water? So the tips that um, Rob and Carrie in the group gave uh, gave me was to so take it slowly, really work on your breathing So very slow breaths, maybe take some water, put it on your arms, the back of your neck and just gradually go in and just just breathe. It's all about the breathing and uh, to not stay in too long. Oh, and talking of that, then how long did you stay in for then? Oh, I think I went in twice. So the first time was maybe a minute and uh, maybe the second time, maybe two minutes. I mean, this is, this is not impressive times at all, well, com- yeah. especially compared to like, you know, the people swimming a thousand meters in this temperature. But um, it was a good start. Yeah, well, I think, uh, uh, you know, we mentioned with uh, back in the interview with Kathy in, in uh, 166, uh, you know, a typical guideline is, uh, you know, a minute per degree. 
Uh, but that's, you know, if you're used to it, I think. And, you know, just getting it, it into that water at all. Particularly, you know, you're in a, in a ski resort. There's probably snow around the side of the lake and things like that. Was it snowing when you got in there? Yeah, it was snowing. I mean, it goes completely against any sort of better judgment you know you sort of strip off to your swimsuit walk down the snowy bank and uh break the ice there was sort of ice on the edge oh. of the lake and uh and enter so it was, oh, uh, that, uh, that already sounds uh horrible what are, in the event itself obviously there's no ice because you know you mentioned they'd made all these different lanes in this uh this area were there any crowds were there people watching the swimming there were, um, you know, a lot of other competitors. Uh, there were some 400 competitors and sort of support team. 400 competitors from about 40 odd countries, actually. Um, and so unfortunately, on the, the final day of competition, it was raining, which then turned to snow. So um, the crowds were a bit, they were huddled inside the, uh, the nearby gymnasium. But there was definitely a great atmosphere. The commentator was brilliant. Um, And there's a real sort of camaraderie between the swimmers because once they get out of the water, there's a whole area set up with jacuzzis and saunas and you can walk past this and, you know, there's groups of swimmers just sat in these jacuzzis for, it looked like hours, (laughs) sort of warming up and chatting and um, it was a really wonderful atmosphere actually. Great. So having been to it then and, you know, having done a bit of, uh, you know, cold water swimming yourself, Katia, are you, are you tempted to try and qualify now and get to the next World Championships? Do you know, I really, I really am. It was, uh, yeah, it was just such a great event. I loved how inclusive it was. Um, I love the fact that actually, you know, it's a GB team that you actually stand quite a good chance of getting on. <laughs> so, I, you know, my chances of sporting greatness are uh, fairly limited in other fields. But I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe if I keep at this, then uh, then I could. I, I really, I'm really tempted, actually. So I've got, when I come back from my next trip, I'm going to head to um, Hampstead Ponds and uh, start my you know, cold water immersion training, uh, seriously. I look forward to following that. And I believe you're writing up an article about the event. Is that for the Telegraph? That's right. Yes. Any idea when that might uh, be published? Uh, I don't, but uh, hopefully fairly soon. My deadline's soon. So hopefully that means (laughs) a, uh, a uh, prompt publishing date okay well when it does when it does come out uh, i'll share that on the ski podcast uh, social and i'll retrospectively drop it into the uh, show notes that's brilliant katia thank you thank you so much for sharing uh, that with us now katie i'm going to move on to uh, to you now in some respects i'm not there are some similarities between what we're going to discuss, I think, and Katia's Ice Swing World Championships in that you're putting yourself in a bit of discomfort because you went uh, traveling in your van uh, last winter touring around the Alps. And it's not what most people would consider to be, you know, a normal way of uh, of uh, staying somewhere when you're on a ski holiday. How, how long were you away for? I was I think in total it was six weeks, six or seven weeks. And I started in at the end of November and I finished, you know, at the end of April and I came back a bit and I left the van in the Alps and, you know, flew back, you know, once, which was at Christmas time. Um, So it was kind of done in parts, but I did about nearly seven weeks in total. Yeah, six or seven weeks staying in a van. So let's be specific here. What kind of van is it? We're not talking about some massive RV, are we? (laughs) Okay, no, but there were lots out there, actually. I was surprised about how many how many campers there were in the Alps when you go out in a van. Um, mine is a transporter, a VW transporter panel van, which is essentially, it was once a builder's van. Um, and it's had a few modifications done to make it kind of wintry and warm. So I insulated it. I put some fat tires on it and raised the suspension. So it was good for snow. Um, it has a diesel heater inside, which keeps it nice and warm and a leisure battery. So you can charge your phone and use your computer. But that's it, really. Inside, it's very basic. <laughs> I'm actually looking at an article uh, now that you wrote up for Full Line uh, magazine. I can see a picture of the van. It doesn't look like there's a lot of space in the back there <laughs> to, you know, manoeuvre. How did that How did that work out? I guess you had your systems in place, right? That you can get your systems in place when there's one person in the van. When there's two in there, it's tricky, and you everyone get and you get on each other's nerves. Um, <laughs> yeah, you do have to be very tidy, which doesn't come naturally for me. And I mean, as always, I think it's the same on any trip or any camping trip. You always have three times as much stuff as you actually need. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, who are you actually sharing with then? 
so I had I did most of it by myself and my boyfriend came out for a bit and then I had um, a sister come out for a bit at the end which was interesting two <laughs> sisters packed into a small space <laughs> right it's essentially a mattress in the back on a little platform you can shove your things down there but I did learn that in winter simple is best less to go wrong for sure and so what about cooking then did you have facilities for that in there <laughs> no that's a complete mess I mean sub-zero temperatures at altitude you, you can't get anything you can't you can't catch any heat off a heater unless you've got a jet boil which is um heats water in about 30 seconds which you can do inside no right that was a real fail for the trip actually cooking <laughs> so how did you survive i read in the article at one point you had a, a farmer providing you with raw milk so presumably straight from the cow right <laughs> that's it that's in austria as you'd expect that hospitality is kind of second to none and everyone's very friendly so um lots of people share their food in austria especially there were lots of um old school campus you know lots of huge winnebagos and german campus who've been doing it for 20 years or something and everyone's quite um friendly um and you're obviously on farmland in austria technically there's a right to roam in austria and switzerland but it's actually very hard to find land in austria to camp on so you're mostly in campsites um and you get the same kind of quality of hospitality as you do in their hotels there but yeah otherwise making coffee in the morning is fine but unless you're cooking packet noodles you're not really cooking outside in terms of actually where you would park your van I mean we we've had a motorhome and uh, and used it we don't have one at the moment we've used it quite a lot touring around Europe and there are various places where it's pretty easy to wild camp and obviously there are campsites as well some campsites you know are closed in the winter you mentioned so it's clearly different by different uh, country and I guess it's different by time of year as well but so in Austria there were a lot of formal campsites that you could uh, go to and then you get hot water you know there's uh, showers and hot water and cooking facilities and things like that are there? In fact it was actually quite difficult to get a place in Austrian campsites I thought I'd be one of the only people camping but that's definitely not the case lots of Austrian campsites and they keep lots of them open um, with great facilities I think the same in Switzerland as well although Switzerland's a lot easier to kind of uh, park up anywhere in camp so you, you tend to do that feels quite good camping for free in Switzerland when everything else is so expensive <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, Italy's um, a lot easier it's a lot more relaxed and you can kind of park anywhere um, right and no one really bothers you and France uh, they definitely like you to be in a campsite Okay, because so you mentioned France. I mean, when we were out in Maribel, uh, when I was out in Maribel last week, I bumped into a chap called Rob Smart, who some people will know, who lives in an RV and has lived in an RV in Monterey for uh, for a long time. And he told me that, you know, since there's, there is that community and you mentioned that community, if you're staying in these campsites... You're going through the same thing that everyone else is, staying in the middle of a freezing cold uh, environment in, you know, suboptimal conditions, uh, uh, let's say. So I guess that you're kind of forced to get to know people well. It just comes naturally. Yeah, it's so the most campers I met by far were the Germans who are well seasoned. They've been doing it for a long time and it was kind of friendly. And obviously you wake up and the first thing you have to do is get out of the van to you know, go and find the bathroom or go and get a coffee or whatever you're doing. You know, you see the same faces, but I guess there's this respect around it that it's your private space. So everyone is quite reserved and, you know, no one comes knocking on your door to say hi or make friends like you do in the summertime. What was quite funny in Switzerland is um, there are two schools of campers. You've got your the people who've been doing it for a long time and the proper, you know, the big fans. And you've also got your ski bums, essentially. And because I think my van looks a bit more like a ski bums van, <laughs> when people walk past you, you know, walking their dog first thing in the morning, they'll come and like basically knock on the door and ask if you're looking for work because their <laughs> restaurant needs an extra person. Or they're like, oh, if you come down this way, down the valley a bit, you know, there's more of us parked down here if you want to be part of the crew. So, Right. I like I like the sound of that. What about I mean, the fact that you were effectively a ski bum uh, during this time, you've got all your ski gear that you've kind of got to get in there as well did you have a special place for slotting that all in and a and a method for kind of getting changed into it in the morning yeah share the bed with your skis I had a roof box on for a lot of the time until it broke and then everything just uh went in the back the system no it's very messy my system <laughs> it was kind of <laughs> skis under the seat wherever there's um 
wherever there's room ski boots in front of the heater the entire time you know the heaters are kind of fitted into the back of the well mine's fitted into the back of the driver's seat so you, you stuff all your ski gear down there so it's warm when you put it on in the morning boots essentially and I actually slept with my skis under the car outside yeah that makes that that makes a lot of sense so one question I haven't asked you yet then Katie is is perhaps a you know one that lots of listeners would be thinking of why would you do this? <laughs> what, was like your, uh, what was your thinking behind it all? Uh, I never thought I'd be a camper, honestly, or a camper vanner. It, um, so it started. I lived in Sun Valley in Idaho for a while, which is, um, for those people that don't know, it's a very old school resort. I think it was one of the first resorts, or it was the first resort that had a ski lift. And until now, it's had a very, um, or it's kind of basically quite posh. Um, apart from there is a big uh, ski bum scene there, I guess. And when I was there, I remember if you, you can, you know, you drive out into the woods to go for a skin or something, and you'll see, you know, through the woods, you'll see like a, a yellow school bus that someone's converted into a home just parked there. Or you'd take the gondola up and suddenly you'd go over a car park full of colourful vans of ski bums, basically waiting for a storm to roll in. I saw that there were lots of dedicated skiers out there who were camping, and it seemed a lot. Uh, a much bigger thing to do in the States. And I was in Japan two seasons ago when COVID hit and I was actually in a van at the time moving around and they've got a right to roam like Scotland. You can just be anywhere. And it started to appeal there, basically. You can just get really off grid, especially if you like uh, ski touring and be super independent and get away from the crowds if that's what you're after. Right. It's interesting you mentioned off grid uh, because I'm going to come on to that in the in the next segment. But you mentioned uh, Sun Valley as well. I happen to be there uh, uh, in the summer. And what you're talking about. Yeah, I see lots of people uh, living in RVs, I think, because you said it's quite posh in Sun Valley. What that means is it's very expensive. And so, for you know, not just the ski bums, but some of the workers who are just working in coffee shops or doing the cleaning jobs, etc., can't afford to live in the town and live permanently in uh, RVs. But it's still very very different vehicles from the one that uh that uh, you were in uh, as well i love the fact that you've uh, you've gone out there and tried it and i guess the flexibility there is that you can you know follow the snow around and just tour around the, you know as you choose that's it yeah it's um we've had a few funky seasons haven't we where there's lots of snow and then you know a little bit of a drought so it's good to be kind of in control of you know where you want to go and I find it quite difficult. Sometimes it's um, difficult to move around in the Alps, isn't it? If you want to kind of go from you know, Switzerland into Austria, um, driving seems the best way. And it's also a really beautiful way to travel. You know, it's all, yeah. all of the, the towns and mountains you see in between is really special. And you don't often get to see that when you're um, doing your classic ski holiday of flying or getting the train out. And, exactly and I think a lot of people it helps you understand how everything links together I mean I spent a lot of time in the mountains in vans in the summer uh, yet to do that in the winter but you know it may be inspired by you I will I will move into that or I might go for something if if feasible uh, slightly uh, more uh, semi-luxurious uh, that's brilliant Katie <laughs> Thank, thanks so much for that so, Katie, that was really interesting then that you mentioned, you know, going off the grid and that's part of the uh, motivation. Last week, as I referred to with Katie, I was out in Maribel. And one of the reasons I was there is I'm writing an article. Well, it's not the reason I was there is to write an article. I'm writing an article about it because I wanted to go off the grid. And I thought it'd be quite interesting to get away from it all actually in the middle of the world's largest ski area. Because, you know, Maribel is the centre of it. It's Letois Valley. But even in a place like that, you can get away from it. And what I did was um, I toured for a, you know, a couple of hours. It was actually two hours, 20 minutes. I went up from Monterey through Lac de Tueda. There was a quite a kind of steep ascent, not very nice ascent because the snow was a bit wet and sticky and the snow kept sticking to the bottom of my skin. So I don't know if you ever had that experience. Really irritating, trying to knock that <laughs> snow off the bottom of your skin. Uh, and then onto a valley. And then I knew this refuge was there. But the key difference is in summer, you can actually accommodate 25 people. Lots of people hike up there. You know, they have a really nice kind of I don't know, restaurant that they serve you, Savoyard, uh, fair, etc. And you can stay there overnight, have a room for 25 people in dorms in summer. But in the winter, it's, uh, it's non-garde. There's no uh, guardian uh, there. And I just thought, well, that sounds really interesting. I'll give that, I'll give that uh, a go. 
and I had a rough idea of where it was. I say rough idea, I'd looked at all the maps, etc. But, you know, as I was going after two hours, I was thinking I still haven't seen it. And it was starting to snow a little bit. I wasn't, I eventually turned a corner, saw it there and managed to uh, find my way in. And this was probably a much higher level of comfort than in your van, uh, Katie. But uh, once I managed to get in there, find the way in, it's basically a little corridor with uh, bunks on either side and some stairs going down. So there were four sets of bunks that all had blankets uh, there. And then downstairs, there was a little kitchen area and there was a a log burner uh, fire. It obviously wasn't on when I got there. There was no electricity. There was no one else there. It was very cold. You could see your breath uh, inside. So um, I kind of got my kind of uh, survival uh, head on, chopped up. There was an axe, chopped up a bit of kindling uh, and got that fire going, which is, you know, great, (laughs) great fun, really, like (laughs) making a fire, not quite uh, in the outdoors. And then I realized that there's no running water as well. I had brought some water with me, but I could I could hear some water and I went out the back and actually there was um, like a, a, a spring, a tap that had to kind of hack away the ice to be able to get access to it and then able to kind of fill up a pan. And there was a gas stove there and made myself a cup of tea. So I was sitting there you know, by the fire, pretty cold still, having my cup of tea, feeling pretty tired. And I thought, oh, I must be time for bed now. I looked at my watch and it was half past five. <laughs> <laughs> it was like i really couldn't believe it. it felt like felt like midnight so you know really interesting uh experience uh katie have you, you stayed in a refuge before up in the mountains i have stayed in a refuge and so i dumped the van in chamonix and then i did the hope route and getting back to the van after a week staying in those remote outposts full of people stinking and snoring It was such a luxury, I tell you. So I'm not sure. I think staying in a van is much more comfortable than you think. It's very contained and cosy, but yours sounds a lot more um, a lot more fun doing it properly and doing all the work yourself and not having to share it with 25 people. If that how many that's how many beds are in there? Yeah, well, actually, having it's only eight in winter, but you know, certainly having the place yourself was you know, I had no idea on my way up uh, whether or not there would be any people there. I did meet a couple of uh, snowshoers who were coming down. And then I met another guy who said he'd walked up there. And that actually did help because they had trodden a path. So I could, you know, I could see roughly which way to go. But you're going across a river valley. And at one point, I obviously missed the bridge. So I had to kind of ford the river to get over, try Uh to make sure I didn't get my feet, you know, uh, wet, just trying to balance on the uh, skis, etc. But yeah, when I got there, you know, there was no one there. And it probably, I think in retrospect, would have been better to do it later in the year when there was more daylight. But it did actually snow kind of the whole time. It snowed when I got there. When I got up in the morning, it was snowing even more heavily. And, you know, my original idea was I had brought these binoculars. I thought, oh, I'll sit outside. You know, I'll, I'll scan the mountains. I'll see some, you know, Bukatan. I'll see some chamois. But, you know, I got up in the morning, I couldn't see a thing <laughs> and thought, well, really, it's probably better just to go back uh, now in case it gets, uh, in case it gets heavier. So why did you choose to do your off-grid experience in uh, Maribel? Well, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, Katie, you know, has chosen to do this off-grid uh, uh, experience as well. And I've seen a whole bunch of research I was looking at from Booking.com saying that I think maybe it's a post-pandemic thing. You know, at one point, we we're all locked up. We'd, the only way we could communicate was kind of how we're doing it today. We're doing it by, you know, a Zoom type of thing. And we were on our computers uh, the whole time. And there's this increasing desire to kind of get away from all of that, where we're tied into our phones and we're tied into our computers. And, you know, I like these experiences where you can go somewhere where you don't have any Wi-Fi, in this case, any phone signal. I could have actually walked outside about five meters, although it was very cold, and get a phone signal. I did do that to get the pings, you know, in the morning. Uh, but it's it's that, really. It's, it's getting literally getting it away from it all and giving yourself some some mind space uh i'm guessing katie that you probably had that kind of experience when you're in your van as well yeah definitely it's quite hard to get especially living in london but, um, <laughs> and there's something about a snowy environment that helps you feel extra isolated isn't it and up high yeah well this definitely was um isolated uh, and up high uh and away from it all would you do it again 
And would you do it solo again? Yeah, yeah, I I definitely would. I really I enjoy uh, that experience. I don't mind being, uh, you know, on my uh, own. And I think, you know, that's part of that disconnect uh, idea, just getting away from it all and having some headspace uh, to yourself. And I like the physical challenge of uh, of getting up there as well. What I would do differently is that um, I probably, knowing that there was gas there and I could warm up water, I would have taken a pot noodle or one of those dehydrated uh, meals with me because it would have been nice to have something uh, hot. But otherwise, yeah, at night, it, you know, it was fine. I wasn't cold um, at all. I mean, there was only blankets and because there was no one else there, I actually went to bed in a liner in a sleeping bag with four blankets uh, on top of me. And uh, yeah, I was plenty warm. <laughs> and do you know the area? Or what navigation tool do you use? Yeah, you well, use I'm really, really slack in that respect because I just looked at a few maps and kind of, you know, could see that it, there was a valley and it went round the valley and, uh, you know, then the uh, refuge would be there. So intuitively, I kind of knew roughly where it was. But, um, yeah, and, and where it sits is it sits between, uh, if you went up and down on on the one side, skiers right as you're ascending, you'd have Mont Valon and that valley there and then up and skiers left on the other side you'd be over to you know Courcheval it's actually Agui de Free um so sometimes you see people descending if uh, anyone knows that area well from Agui de Free on the Mirabel side down towards like the Tweda but it's right on the border of the national park and in the national mm-hmm. park itself you're not allowed to ski so you're allowed to ski tour up there because it just falls outside that border and you know from a from a you know being in nature point of view you know it was uh it was fantastic like that so that was being off the grid you know you can do it in a van you can do it in a in a refuge a slightly more normal perhaps if you if you consider it like that and you probably wouldn't if you think of uh, eddie the eagle edwards but ski jumping is a sport that goes on and on and uh, rob reese who's been on the uh, podcast before on several occasions has recently been out in innsbruck and he sent us this report from the bergsill ski jumping competition <laughs> Here at uh, the Berg Isel in Innsbruck today for the Fia Schonsen ski jumping tournament. That's the famous tournament you've probably seen between Christmas and New Year on Eurosport for years and years and years. Well, it's always been a lifetime ambition to come and watch one of these, and we're here at uh, the third event of the Four Hills, which is the event in Innsbruck. There are normally two events before that Obersdorf and Garmisch, which have gone since uh, Christmas and New Year and we're here now on the 5th of January at uh, Bergiesel which is an amazing ski hill which sits on the hills just above Innsbruck and you can normally see it from the Brenner Pass. We're in the packed stadium here, 25,000 spectators of all different nationalities. It's a very international sport, it's all part of the World Cup ski jumping competition these four jumps over the holiday period obviously traditionally it's been dominated by the Norwegians the Austrians the Germans Czechs Poles Finns and obviously the Japanese Um, it's a very wide field I think there's 15 different nationalities competing today and uh, it's just a fantastic atmosphere everybody uh, having a drink eating their sausages and Wiener schnitzels typical Austrian uh, day Uh, great DJ ramping the crowd up between uh, the jumps and it's just one of those things you should probably all come and see if you love your skiing and love your winter sport so we have just witnessed the first part of the competition which is 50 jumpers that have pre-qualified yesterday uh, basically have uh, a head-to-head the 25 head-to-head jumps so we've just undergone that and we're just about to come to the finale now which is those 30 jumpers um, obviously scoring is based upon the distance you jump and the style with which you land uh, every hill has a K point, which is the length of the hill that you should jump. The K point on this hill is a 120 meters. It's a 120 meter hill, it's the big hill. And obviously if you are behind the K point, you get points deducted. And if you're ahead of the K point, you add points, but also you get points for your landing. You have to land with both feet uh, in a perfect telemark. And that is added. there are five judges who then score your 
style effectively. Um, the best, uh, the, 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 the highest score and the lowest score discarded. So there's three judges' scores count, and then that is added to the distance you jump. So it's basically a combination of distance jumped and the style with which you land. There are then alterations for wind and wind direction and also the gate position. So the higher up the hill you start means you'll get more speed on takeoff which means you'll obviously land further down the strip. So if you're taking a higher uh, gate position you get um, some points deducted for that. And obviously if you've got the wind um, onto you uh, on the hill which, uh, which means that you're getting a little bit more lift so if the wind wind is blowing against the direction of travel you'll effectively get more lift and go further so there's points deducted for that well that was an amazing finale of second jumps at the Burgiesel. eventual winner was david david kabachi and again it shows the um interesting way this sport is uh, um scored halva egna granarud the norwegian actually out jumped him significantly in his second jump by over 12 meters but David Kabachi was going from a much lower gate position on both of his jumps. He went from gate position 7 and 8 on his uh, first two jumps. And Granarud was uh, going from position 9 gate. So despite him jumping much further, Halva Egner Granarud didn't actually win. He had a total of t 261 points and David Kabachi had 265 points. Win didn't really play a role today. But it was a very, very interesting climax. And I have to say, um, the Four Hills is certainly one of the most interesting things I've ever watched. Um, David uh, Kibachi's win means that uh, Halva Egner Granarud cannot make a clean, clean sweep of the Four Hills this year. He obviously won the ter first two events in Obersdorf and garmisch partenkirchen So he moves on to um, Bishopshofen, which is the uh, last jump of the Four Hills. Um, Unfortunately, not able to do the clean sweep. There's only been three people who've done that before. Uh, Sven Hannawald being the first in uh, 2000, 2001, which was the 50th um, anniversary of the jump. So it's a very rare f uh, feat to have done. But Bishop's often is the last hill. It's always been the last hill, and it's a very different setup. It's a grass bank stadium, and uh, it's a very different shaped hill to Innsbruck. So to actually do a clean sweep is quite some feat because all four hills have slightly different shapes. They've all got a K point of 120 metres, but they require slightly different techniques and obviously the, the, weather, the weather and the wind can be quite different on both days. So anyway, um, if you want to have a, an interesting uh, week of winter sports, base yourself in Innsbruck or around. There's lots of good ski resorts around there. I've had a couple of days up on the Stubai Glacier, perfect conditions at the beginning of January, despite all the tropical weather and lack of snow. Perfect skiing conditions up there. There's about 40 k's of skiing. And there's uh, ski hills dotted all around Innsbruck. And also, if you are going to go and um, do follow the other hills, there's plenty of skiing in Germany. And obviously, there's a lot of skiing around Bishopshofen. There's places like Hochkönig, Saubach, Hinterglem, and the whole of the Ski Amadei. Anyway, that's been a fantastic experience and I would recommend that any of you um, who like uh, interesting sports to try and get yourself along in the first week of January to watch the Four Hills and do a bit of skiing. Thank you. Wow, that was fascinating. I would love to uh, go to that type of event myself and Innsbruck is actually a great city, so hopefully I'll get out there at some point. Now, we're just moving to the close now. I enjoy all feedback about the show, so please do contact me on social at The Ski Podcast or you can email me the ski podcast at gmail.com uh, i'd like to say thank you to laura hargrave who who said uh, i've come across your podcast recently and i have to say that i love it thank you laura and dave mills he very kindly bought me a coffee he says i'm a recent convert brilliant format unbelievable variety of ski boarding equipment sustainability and resort related subjects i'm now hooked for life well that's great uh, dave i really appreciate that and i also appreciate you uh, buying me a coffee which listener if you feel so inclined if you go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash the ski podcast you can do that as well don't forget listener there are over 160 episodes of the ski podcast to catch up with and i had a, a little look there are 141 of them were listened to in the last week so don't forget to subscribe uh, so you don't miss uh, an episode at all now you can follow me at Skipedia and the podcast at the Ski Podcast. But for now, I'd like to thank Les Trois for sponsoring the show and thank my guest today, Katya. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And Katie. Thanks very much. See you out there in the van. <laughs> and finally, listener, thank you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye.